Hey guys and welcome to today's Train Sim TV video. Now you found me out in real life today, not stuck behind a computer simulator, we're doing something totally different. And we're going to start a Lost Railway series. Now you found me here today on the middle of main line. Believe it or not, this was a 90 miles an hour main line right behind me. Hard to believe, I know these days when you look at that, that you don't think it was a main line. But what we're going to look at is the middle of main line as it was known, also known as the North Midland Railway. And it used to run between Derby and Leeds, opening in 1840 again as a part of the bigger line from London St Pancras to Glasgow. Now since moving to this area back in March last year I've noticed there's not really many videos covering what is to be honest with you a pretty fascinating old railway. There's a lot of ballast behind and there's a lot of other relics that you'll find as we go through this video that you wouldn't necessarily expect to see. There's a water tower for instance just that way that we'll see later on. Now this line as I said it opened in 1840. The station here at Cuddeth which we have on the site of opening as Barnsley. The Allen's Guide initially referring to the station as Cuddeth Bridge with Barnsley. And it also referred to the fact that there was an omnibus taking you two and a half miles to Barnsley itself, which was actually sort of over there through those trees. Well, Barnsley still is over there through those trees. Um, and that was how you actually got to Barnsley. Now it retained that name until 1854. And in 1854, it actually changed the name to Barnsley with Cuddeth. And that is when they actually opened another station in Barnsley, the one that is now Barnsley Interchange. So please do join us for this trip around this area. We're going to take a look at the line from here at Cuddeth towards Woff Road Junction, which is the section that closed as far as Goosehill Junction at Normanton back in the 1980s. We're going to have a lot of old images and stuff along the way. We're going to try and find some of the locations of those original photos and see what they look like today. So enjoy the video, guys. Thanks for watching, as always. So as I said, we start our journey here at Cuddeth Station, the site of which closed back in 1968. Now, we're looking over here and we're looking at what was the view north from Platform 1, I believe it was, at Cuddeth Station, towards Goosehill Junction, Normanton, and onwards to Leeds, the section to Goosehill Junction, as I said, closing as a through in 1988. There is still a section of that open up there and we'll go on to talk about that later on. Now, looking back behind us over there, we've got the line they used to head off towards Sheffield and the south and Wharf, and you used to have to go across the stairfoot if you turned right just down there at Cuddeth Station South Junction. You've also got my fiancée Becky who has joined me to film this video, despite looking very bored on her phone. She is accompanying me on this video. So we're going to start walking along here and we're on the site of what was Cuddeth Station. It was a five platform station, reaching way across there over towards that sort of hill in the background. Well, on what was Platform 1, there was a station building located just here as I said with a further couple of island platforms in the middle over there and then a further freight platform right at the back over there. Cut a station it was not a major station by any means it's a fairly big town these days but it was not a major station it didn't get stopped at by St Pancras Expresses and stuff like that it was called at by the stopping trains and stuff from Sheffield to Leeds it was not a major station by any means but it was also the terminating point of the Hull and Barnsley Railway, which opened in 1885, and they had a platform right down the back, Platform 5, which we'll go over and have a look at. Um, and Platform 5 was where the Hull and Barnsley line actually terminated. They never actually reached Barnsley itself, they only got as far as Cuddeth with their passenger services. So you got over here, you would have had, this is roughly where the sort of footbridge and stuff was actually on the station. And you would have had four platforms over here. And then at the very back is where the Hull and Barnsley platform and goods shed and stuff was, good platform was. Before we go any further, it's probably wise for me to actually explain what we're doing here and what the routing originally was on, on a map. So on this zoomed out view, you've got Sheffield over here on the left and the old road as it's known around Sheffield on the right. Taking Masborough, where I'm circling my mouse at the moment, you can probably see the hand there, as the start point for our little look at this. The uh, yellow line being the middle main line heading north until it gets to Swinton, which is the obviously still national network. Where it changes to pink or a, a maroon colour, that's where currently the cross country services they now turn right, heading up to Moorthorpe, through onto that pinky coloured line, through to Wakefield onto the red line, before eventually getting to Leeds. 
The Midland Main Line, as I said, it was the direct route, the most direct route from Sheffield to Leeds. At Swinton, instead of turning right there, at Waffrow Junction, you would have turned left. On that yellow line, all the way up through here, Darfield, onto the section that we're focusing on from Stores Mill Junction in Part 1 to Cudduff. Heading on this yellow line, all the way through Normanton to Leeds. You can see just how much shorter that was. And we're going to talk again more about that. Now looking in more in detail what we're going to focus on here, you got Cudduff Station site, you can see there were some sidings on the west side there. The Hull and Barnsley side being the orange bit there. Again, the Hull and Barnsley they diverged just north at Carlton and then headed eastwards eventually towards Hull. So we'll look from Cudduff Station in part one down to Stars Mill Junction down here, focusing again on, on the Chapel Town Line Junction and all the stuff that was going on in this area. It's quite an interesting area of, of stuff and there's quite a lot of little bits of old infrastructure and whatnot dotted along the way and a lot of history to go along with it. So. So we have now moved around the corner, we're actually on what was the station approach at the road down there. As I said, the omnibus would have gone down there. To reach the main road to Barnsley, down there is the main road into Cudduff. Indeed, you've got the old railway retaining wall here, just where the station entrance actually was. There's even a old number on the wall there. I'm not sure what that means, but there was an old number there. So you had the station approach, you had a couple of different ways in. There was another way there, which was actually station road was up there. But uh, this is where the entrance once was, just to our right. We're going through a gap in the wall here, but anyway, I'll do, I suppose. And this is what you would first be met with when you walked onto the station. It's obviously all now a public footpath these days, but again, looking down there towards Sheffield, this way towards Leeds. Now we're going to start taking a little wander north to start with here. Again, there's all ballast on this section. We can actually go through to make our way across the ballast along the former trap bed, trying not to get prickled in the eyewood tree whilst in the process. And we are now on what was the section of line through the station. Now the reason this bit's more ballasted than that bit is because despite this line actually closing as a through route in 1988, some of it stayed open even until 1996. Um, and that was this section here, sort of these outside tracks, they stayed open right until 1996 to serve the colliery down at Grimethorpe. The colliery down at Grimethorpe having shut in 1993, the line stayed open until 96 because there's a glass work that you will see sort of just through those trees, you'll get a better view of it in a minute. The glass works at Monk Breton requiring a sand train a couple of times a week. You just have to go through here, down there to Grimethorpe, a couple of miles away, to actually run round. And you just have to run round down there before coming back and then reversing towards the glass works, which is just about a mile in front of us. Interesting, that section of line is actually still there. They didn't shut that, it stayed open. And the sand train still indeed does go to the glass works, which you probably can just now see through the trees in front of me, dominating the hill up there. So we're only a mile short of what is essentially the national network. So we're now working our way at north again. Now this is about the site of Cudder Station North signal box. It was located in this area. And uh, that shut in 1957. The remaining box was left at Cuddus Station South. But this is an interesting little vantage point. You've got the old retaining wall there, but they've also got these modern pipe fencings. So we're on what would have been essentially the middle of the formation here. So you can sort of get an idea of just how wide said formation was. Over there would have been the actual Hull Marnsley lines. They were on the far side and they used to turn right and head east just north of Cuddus. And then over here was all the middle and main line. You had two lines over there and then two lines here. And indeed there was some more junctions just off of here. So yeah, this is the old Hull Marnsley. You can tell this, is, uh, this has been closed since the late 50s just because of the condition of the ground. It's not got anything on it. So you can tell obviously with the tree growth over here, you've got some pretty meaty boys over here that this side, the Hull and Barnsley side, you can tell it's been shut a lot longer. Indeed, it did shut back in 1959, I think it was, as a through route, all the way through to Hull. There was a section up to Roundup Junction and Moorhouse House, which stayed open until the 1960s. That was for coal movements, and so coal trains could reverse into Monks of Coke Works, which was up at Royston, about two miles that way. Now, there isn't much in the way of relics of the old Hull and Barnsley, although I suspect this over here could well be one of them, an old sleeper still with its chair attached to it. Now I suspect that is Hall and Barnsley era, I don't think that's 
Midland Main Line, the Midland Main Line, as well snowed out as we go over here, was concrete sleepers. So that may well be one of the last remaining pieces of the Hulton Mansel here. As I said, it closed in 1959, I think it was, as a through line. The passenger services actually haven't finished way back in 1932. Such was the great success of them. Becky trying her best not to look too embarrassed to be on the camera. And uh, yeah, it lost its passenger service back in 1932 here to Hull itself and South Howden, I think it was, where the services used to run to in those days. Hull and Barnsley was never very successful and we'll go on to cover that in a whole different video, I think, at a later date. But it's just up here where that used to actually diverge off towards Royston, Carlton and the east eventually. So move back over here and we'll take a little bit more of a look at what we're here to focus on really, which is the Midland Line. We're just going to take a look up at the road bridge in a second, where it used to be anyway. You can see there's some old foundations of something, I'm not entirely sure what it is, but that is a relic of something concrete that used to be there. But we can now get a clear view of that glassworks that I was mentioning, the Mount Britain glassworks. And they need the actual sort of steepness of the banking at this point. The retaining wall is still down there, lower down below us. As I mentioned, a line of this importance wouldn't have just seen a coal train and a stopper from Leeds to Sheffield going on it. It would have featured much more important traffic than that, and indeed it did. The Thames Clyde Express, the Midlands' most impressive and most important passenger train, used to actually come through here. You, you, you really can't imagine these days, such as a Royal Scott or a Jubilee, storming around just over there on the fast lines behind me at 90 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour through here probably. Regulator wide open, whistle blaring. Passengers enjoying the journey to London, having just come over the set on Carlisle or looking forward to going over the set on Carlisle on an hour or so if you're heading north. It's just impossible to believe that that ever happened as you stand here with the bird song and the associated sounds that you hear from Barnsley. But as you stand here in what is essentially a pretty peaceful location it's hard to believe that it ever had such a scene of sort of drama but if you the the Thames Clyde Express for instance did used to come this way it would have turned off at Swinton as we now know it just north of there at Waff Road Junction it would have turned off and turned left and headed north through here to Goosehill Junction where it would have joined the Waver to Normanton line or rather the Manchester to York line at Goosehill Junction just outside Normanton station it would have followed that line for a mile or so, before turning west and heading north, eventually towards Leeds. Once it reached Leeds via Sturton and Methley Junction, and uh, passing what is now Midland Road Depot and Holbeck Depot, it would have headed into Leeds City, and it would have carried north onwards to the Settle and Carlisle via Skipton, obviously the Air Valley Line, working its way onto the Settle and Carlisle Line, and heading north to Glasgow via Carlisle. It's hard to believe that that ever happened here. It wasn't the only name train that came this way. You also had, for instance, the um, the Waverley that used to come this way. That used to head up to Edinburgh. Once you got to Carlisle, that actually went over what is now the Waverley route. That used to come this way back in the day. And you had other name trains. You had the Devonian, the famous train from Bradford to Paynton that used to come this way. That used to come on from Leeds, obviously. Once it really worked its way from Bradford Exchange to Leeds, and from Bradford it would have worked its way into Leeds and then down here along the Midland as far as Sheffield where it would have obviously turned to head southwest towards Burton 
and onwards to Birmingham and the south and Paynton and many holidays. So you can just imagine the happy memories that have been had here, people going through on the train on the way to the holidays and any other thing like that. And you know, you start standing here in the trees and in the quiet. And it's hard to believe that that ever took place. And the fact there was a station here, those people employed here, people used the railway here to get to the jobs that used to use this railway to go for days out. And now there's nothing here. It's a pretty big town with no connection at all. And it's hard to believe that it was actually a, a, a core main line. It wasn't just some giant line somewhere. This was a main line. It was a four track main line, but it's gone. And we're gonna look at why it's gone because there's obviously got to be a reason why would you shut the most direct way from Sheffield to Leeds because that's what it was. Why would you shut that? Well, let's take a look and let's explore why they shut that because there are good reasons behind it. Whether they were managed properly is another matter, but there are reasons behind it. And let's take a look at exactly what they were further into the video. So now at south side of Cut Off Station, on the uh, side where the Horn Barns the sidings used to be, there were some good sidings on this side. And we're coming to have a look at this interesting looking building on the uh, far side underneath the uh, rock cutting. Now I've seen people say that this used to be a water tank and there used to be a tank on top of it, but what we think it is, is actually a wartime bunker. There's obviously, you can see there, the uh, metal things on the side of it. We believe they're ventilation. Now there is room for a tank on top of it, whether there was a water tank up there is a different matter, I've seen people say that there was. The reason we believe this is a wartime bunker is for starters obviously there's a the concrete looks like it's from that sort of area and also there's a door not only on this side, there is a door on the other side and the way it's constructed would appear to show that it dates from the war rather than just some water reservoir. Now the walls are water reservoir which I believe is actually up there somewhere where they're now built houses. The reservoir tank used to fill the water tower, which we're going to go see in a minute, which was located just outside the station on the south side near the signal box. So I've seen people say they think this was the water reservoir tank, but I don't think it is. I think that's more war related, whether it was to protect local people or the railway workers or what during the war, I'm not sure. But that is what my suspicion of that is, rather than just a reservoir tank. Now, today is, well it's actually day three, but this is spliced into the middle of the video. I've got Matt with me today, who you may know from the uh, streams of Shoot the Bandit. He's joining me on today's film. We've been having a little look down here already at various bits. I'm gonna work our way slightly southward towards the uh, water tower. So we're just working our way south now towards where the former Cut of South station box was. And we've got First sign of a couple of sleepers lying about. And there's also a foundation of something here. We're not sure what that is the foundation of. It goes on for a good couple of hundred yards in that direction towards where the uh, box used to be and back in that direction towards the station. So we're not sure what this is the foundation of, although it's obviously the foundation of something, whether it was a retaining wall at some point. It could have been, although there is another more older brick retaining wall at the top of there. And Matt's just found a couple of bricks over here. So we keep finding bricks lying around and we're looking at them. The ones that are sort of strewn about have dates on. There's one behind you actually with a date on it. It's got something written on it, an S or something. So we're looking to see if any of these have got dates on. And we're not sure what that is, it just says an S. Um, we don't want to disturb anything that's not already loose laying. Because it's not fair to uh, move stuff already, but some of these bricks look quite modern, some of them are quite old. Now there was obviously, as I said, there was a retaining wall at the top and there was a second signal box in this location, generally speaking. We're not sure exactly where it was, but as we work our way south, this is where this, uh, the uh, Cut of South station box was. And it was over there. And we'll take a look at that in a second. But before that was built in 1900, there was an earlier box built in 1890. And that was located somewhere in this sort of vicinity. And we found over there 
remains of an old brick wall which we're going to take a look at now we don't think that is probably the actual box location the box we feel like was probably somewhere around here and this would have been the 1890 signal box so as i say the main one which we're going to take a look at in a minute was built in 1900 a midland railway box i'm just going to climb away up this little banking and show you over here can't go across because there's a fence in front of me but the brick retaining wall now it is flat in front of that but i don't think that is where the actual signal box was although the bricks would suggest it is older there's actually a parapet on it which is interesting because there was never a bridge or anything there but you can see another pile of bricks just up there which is where the retaining wall once ran and i believe somewhere up there is where the water tank would have been on top of the hill the reservoir to feed our water tower which is just there through the trees so the signal box here at could have south sort of station south should i say opened 1900 and it controlled the south end of the station until 1957 when the north end of the station their box shut could have station north box shut 1957 this then took control of the whole area actually linking up with could have south junction which sounds bizarre because that's obviously could have north in that direction but there was a junction up there called could have south junction so this box opened 1900 this is the original foundations of that box as you can see still in place today I'm not sure what part of that would have been but it's uh, clearly where it once stood it was burnt down in 1988 September 1988 it burnt down shortly after becoming a block post when they uh, cut the rest of the line through beyond Waffle Road Junction some old signal cabling included in there now this foundation here even has a, a water pipe sticking up from the side and You'll see on the photo that's displayed on the screen at the same time, we actually found exactly what it used to be. It was a little temporary building, only added probably in the mid 80s, but you can see the twin foundations of that building here, along with the water pipe. It's amazing just how that tree has sort of sprung right up between the foundations of what was that little temporary building. Next to the map's well, there's the remains of signal cable. I'm not sure. There wasn't actually a signal located there, so obviously it may have been a box or something, a relay box or something around here. But the interesting thing we did find on this side was we found, well first of all, we found two signal posts. There's a signal post just there, and there's another one just here. And I'll try and display a photo on the screen around this town where you can see clearly where we are here, but you've got this signal post here, and also the, for reference to show that it was the signal post, you've got where the uh, relay cabinet is in one of the photos you can actually see the original pot where that used to sit or not the pot but the foundation of it you can even see where the bolts uh, would have gone on to actually secure the cabinet to the ground so that we believe that is a signal post originally and then you've got this sort of assorted pile of blue brick and other bits of concrete that's um what are they called bits of rebar what rebar rebar um which Matt's got there on the back of the rock and obviously like I said this blue brick here which I'm about that, that's, that looks like it could have been a tensioner possibly you know like a strengthening yeah button. possibly but there's certainly a pile of just assorted stuff here and we're not sure what the origins of all this is but these blue bricks here would appear to have possibly come from a little structure that used to be next to the signal box again I'll sort of mark that out in a photo at the same time So we're now going to take a look at what's suspected to be the original water tower from 1840 built when the line opened in uh, middle of railway days it would have been a water tank on top which i'll put in a photo that you can actually see that in on the background but uh, just before we do move into the water tower just note how sort of clear the trap bed is there's nothing growing on it i've seen lines that have been shut a couple of years in a worse state than that you wouldn't think it had been shut for 27 years it's just ballast all the way 
as far as the eye can see. Obviously there's a tree that's sort of grown across there, but the same sort of applies in that direction. There's not really much in the way. That would have been between the tracks, more or less in the middle there. So that's why that's probably sprouted up a bit more. Remember this side did stay up until 96, whereas the lines over there were taken up in 85 and 87 respectively. I'm going to take a look inside the water tower. We've already done a vecchi to make sure there's no needles, because that's always the fear when you come in somewhere like this. Although there is the top of the bottle there on the floor. Um, Watch that. Now, this is the inside of the actual water tower. I'm not sure what these blocks on the floor are. I don't know what they are. I don't know. Did you decide? No, I think it's something to do with it, obviously. System that they have, you know, from up above. Maybe getting water up there. Be interesting in the comments if anybody knows exactly what the function would have been of those, but you see there's quite a bit of roof detail up there. Are they concrete beams at the top, would they are? Steel. Steel beams at the top. And you can see obviously around the window, uh, well, I don't know if there were windows, but you can see there's a lot of areas where it's not really structurally sound. Although, there's definitely something that came where underneath these blocks, in the roof, you can see where they were mounting for a pipe. I don't know if GoPro can pick yeah, it up. Yeah, I can see that, yeah, there's a mountain there, yeah. There? I'm pointing my hand at it. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. There would have been a mountain there for something. There's something in the corner there as well. Yeah. So yeah, you see obviously there's mountains on here. So it's interesting to see inside. Although like I say, it's not really structurally sound all the way around anymore. Who knows how long it'll actually last. Um, but it's not actually been needed since 1966-67 would have been the last time it was needed when steam finished around here in, I think it was November 67 when you last had steam in this area. A lovely finished structure there. But it's an amazing structure considering its age of 1840. It's a shame that it's not really done up but there's been no reason to do it up and I'm more surprised that they haven't just knocked it down. Whether it's listed for some reason I don't know. Deserves to be listed. It's the last remaining structure of the former Midland Main Line in this area, but other than the bridges, obviously, but it's certainly interesting and worth coming to take a look at. The uh, fence was only added a few years ago and then it didn't take long to get smashed up, so. But yeah, that's the water tower south of Cutter Station as we now make our way around the side to where there's a couple of other sort of more modern additions. And these include cable troughing over there also what i'm going to look at here is this little wooden post now i could see around here somewhere there used to be a mile post somewhere in the bushes i suspect up there in fact that maybe could be the uh, original post there something there anyway although i thought it would have been a, a more permanent structure now what i'm looking at here is this wooden post and i believe this used to be signal reels you can see the holes where it would have attached and also at the bottom in fact that confirms it is the actual reel at the bottom there you see where the cable used to go around it. It's still there at the very bottom. So that would have been signalling wire that would have been attached to that. And you've also got these, there's a piece of pipe out of the ground there. These interesting cable troughs. Now these cable troughs would have been put in probably in the 70s when they started adding colour lights into this area, maybe late 60s. But I would suspect 1970s. There's another a, a clip over there, is it a tantrum clip or something like that? I can't pandor clip, I can't remember what it's called. But it's interesting how the tree has just ruptured straight through the middle where the cable used to run. There's no cable obviously in there, you know, it's just empty with leaves and dirt. Although there is signal cable strewn around in various places. This is something to do with a drainage port. Now there's a drainage port between the lines just there. So that's what this is something to do with. And again, it looks like there's a signal reel holder just there in the middle. This cable trough is, to be honest with you, almost in brand new condition. It's concrete lid and would have housed on top of the, uh, the cable trough in itself. There's then other bits of assorted stuff over here and I'm not sure if these are really railway related but this cable troughing does carry on for quite a way in that direction. It's, it completely disappears into the trees but it does sort of keep going in that direction for a while. So what we're now walking up towards was where the junction known as Chapeltown Line Junction was also could have station south junction was located and that was just up here you wouldn't believe it now looking at all these trees but basically in a forest and this line used to head off heading west from here towards Monksburn junction which was near Wombwell just north of Wombwell about three or four miles and it would be used as a diversionary route for trains off the middle and main line such as the Thames Clyde Express which would have headed along where we are walking now on its route from London to Glasgow it would have headed 
through to Sheffield as normal, then at Meadowall Junction it would have turned left, headed up through Ecclesfield, Chapel Town, hence the name the Chapel Town Loop that it gained. And then when it got to Muxbin Junction just north of Woonwell, would have headed east towards Stairfoot and gone over the top of Stairfoot on a viaduct before heading up here and rejoining the Midland Main Line at Cudworth Station South Junction, as I said, aka Chapel Town Line Junction. Where walking towards where the divergence was, the junction itself was located a little way behind us where the point work actually was, but the uh, divergence itself is just ahead in front of us. Now, it's actually got an interesting history of this and we'll probably cover it in a further video at some point, but after it closed through to Monksman Junction in the 1960s, they actually rerouted this line around the tunnel at Ardsley. Ardsley tunnel was 200 yards long in length and the tunnel itself is still there, although at one end it's capped off. They rerouted the Midland line around the tunnel to join it onto the former Hull and Barnsley line to Stairfoot, which meant that it then gained a connection to Stairfoot itself rather than going over the top on a viaduct. It gained a connection to where Stairfoot station used to be. And that remained open until 1985. What that allowed to happen was coal trains to actually go from this line, the Midland main line, across to Stairfoot and then through to Waff, right, your Waff Yard and beyond. So you would have freight that could get through to the Hope Valley. You would have freight that could go across to Manchester, such as MGR trains that would transfer to Class 76s, for instance, at Waff Sidings. Now this stayed open until 1985 when this line shut. It was no longer the Chapel Town Loop, obviously, after the 60s, it was no longer the Chapel Town Loop. The Chapel Town Loop being the name given for the diversion trains. It was then the Stairfoot Branch. Track was removed in the late 80s, having been down to signal latterly. And as I said, the last train's running along here in 1985. Nonetheless, an interesting history, especially with that divergence and actually drawing on, on to what was essentially another line further along it. So we're now on this incredibly wide bridge, it's hard to believe just how wide it was, but it did used to carry at least six trucks because it had four for the Midland Main Line and then two for the Chapel Town Loop Line. So we're going to take a look over this side of it, it crosses Small Bridge Dyke, which is just down below, and uh, it's just a very small watercourse that sort of heads around the bottom end of Cudworth. Maybe this was the uh, bridge in question when they named the uh, station down at uh, Cudworth, but you can actually see there's all sorts of bits in the river, there's cable trunking, um, lids and all sorts of assorted railway gubbins. You can see the big retaining wall on the side of the bridge. You can actually get underneath it, we may do that in a second. Interesting thing on here is, well, one of the interesting things is the old cable run thing on the side there, but the signage. Just how modern that is, it's not only is it the network, sorry, it's not, it doesn't mean it was put in 1980, that's the Highways Act 1980, it's network rail. It's also got the hex. Uh, pattern on the signs, which you know that and look how much on the clean the bolts. So that, that looks to me almost as if it's been put in in the last almost last year or two. And I don't remember it looking that new when I came down before. So it's clear that they were still obviously they're still in charge of the uh, the course of the line. But it's interesting that they're still putting signage and stuff on over 30 years after it closed. It, it seems a bit crazy really, and who can think of the expense of it? We'll see a bit more of it later on, but. It's certainly interesting to see on the left now. Let's see if we can get down here without breaking my neck. So it's probably not wise to go down and hold the camera as well, but you can see the bridge decking over there now as we uh, clamber very, precari very, very precariously <laughs> down the embankment. So this is Small Bridge Dyke under here. Oh Christ. It's uh, certainly an interesting looking thing. And uh, all metal decking underneath, as you can see. I'm just trying not to get tripped up by a farm. There's still quite a lot of railway 
furniture, I would call it, down here. And uh, I'll try and make my way into that deck in there if I just, without falling straight in the river. There's also some design. That office chair should be over there, I've never seen it uh, last year. You get a lot of fly tipping around here, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, there's bits of railway furniture that shouldn't really be in a river, but it's in a river nonetheless. It's a, a pretty impressive structure to see and uh, a very impressive piece of engineering. Way further along this cutting, probably will be a good opportunity to actually talk about what caused this line to close in the 1980s. Why did it shut as a through line in 1987? Indeed, the passenger traffic having been diverted off it in 1985. So it's now 38 years since it saw a passenger train. In those days, it would have been HSTs on services to places in the south. I'm just climbing over a tree. You know, your cross country services and midland services as well would have come down here. But uh, it's shut for a multiple a number of reasons, but the main one was subsidence, mining subsidence, as I'm sure you know. This area of Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire, West Yorkshire, well known for its coal mining. As I, I might look as if I'm going up and down. I hold the camera straight, and you can sort of see. I'm going up and down these hills, and that is why this line shut. Mining subsidence. I'm literally going up and down constantly. I try to hold the camera as flat as I can, so you can sort of see. I'm sort of making it a bit more dramatic than it is, but I can't really illustrate very well how it looks, but. You can see, certainly, the rises and falls, and they're a good four or five foot, some of them, in height. <laughs> I'm not, you know, that's not an exaggeration, you, some of the ones further on, you will go down into knee height and above, just how deep it goes, and it's incredible how that happened, but that is, again, it's mining subsidies, and this section just here is particularly where it's bad, about half a mile south of Cudworth. And you'll find, as we saw up at Cudworth Station, it was actually flat and perfect, really. But this next sort of half a mile, three quarters of a mile is, is in an awful condition in terms of subsidence and where it's uh, dipping and diving. And that undermining of the railway is what caused the eventual closure in the 1980s. Um, it wasn't actually the first time that passenger services have been diverted off it though. In 1985, obviously, they finished for good. But prior to that, in 1968, the problem had always existed of mining subsidence. You know, in steam days, they had always struggled with the issue and causing speed restrictions and stuff like that. But it got so bad in the 1960s that they, they actually made a decision in 1968 that enough was enough. They needed to close the line to passenger traffic. So it was the case in 1968. They stopped actually running passenger trains along the middle and main line. The cross-country services would head, as they do now, through Marthorpe down to Swinton. The current route in, whilst they actually upgraded this line and made it so it could take traffic again. And it was in 1973 that cross-country trains and such returned to this line in full force for a further 12 years till 1985. Now in 1985 they decided, but well actually before I go on to 1985, ironically in the time between 73 and 85, I understand the Marfort line actually suffered from the exact same issue of mining subsidies, but obviously that was fixed in a more permanent way because that's still open to this day. But in 1985, these problems, they reared the head again in quite a significant way. There was never any developments around here due to subsidies or anything like that, but the problem obviously got so bad that they decided, look, enough is enough with this. Let's change routing, and that is when the trains permanently changed their routing via Morthorpe, so they would head out of Leeds City, go across through Wakefield Westgate, a station that actually wasn't on the cross-country network prior to that date, and they would then head to South Kirby Junction, Marthorpe, Swinton, passing the site of, after 1987, Wathrow Junction on the way. So it was the case that, interestingly, Wakefield gained its cross-country services following the closure of this line. If it hadn't have been for the closure of this line in 1987, 1985, for when the trains actually stopped running on it in passenger form, that Wakefield Westgate, for instance, would not have had the cross-country services that it now gets.
short way further down now, we're on a, a farm access bridge. This is Burton Lane farm access. And nothing particularly interesting about this. We're onto a four track formation now rather than six, obviously, because we've passed the divergence of the Chapel Town Loop. You can see up there, but clearly. We're on the side of the lines, which would have been the ones that shut in 1987 over here. But there's nothing massively interesting about this bridge. It's very basic, really. It's just a farm bridge. Burn Lane being down below the farm itself. There's a, fend a sign over here which is very similar, but is the same as the one we saw on the bridge earlier. But no how much older that one is. There's no hex pattern on it, and the bolts and everything are the screws are much more rusty, which shows just that that's obviously a lot older. It's still a network rail sign, but I would suspect that one's getting on for being 20 years old. Now, the interesting thing about this little bridge is actually what's next to it, and it's those quad rails, they've been a bit smashed up. When I came last year, when I came when I first moved to this area, they were brand new. They were still up here as well. So they've been obviously ripped off by the uh, kids. But these things were only designed in the last 10 years. So what purpose really is that serving? What, what ex what's the reason for expense on that? I don't, I see, obviously it's to stop people coming up, I guess. Protecting them from being knocked down by... Well, you're not going to get knocked down by a train, let's be honest. I'm not sure what it's protecting them from, but it's obviously a network they've got to protect the line side. Somebody in the comments, I'm sure one of you will know why they still do this, but surely it's not a very good way of uh, spending money. Now, the fence actually isn't the only interesting thing. The other interesting thing, which one of you may know in the comments, is what is this? I suspect this may be something to do with the substance. I've never seen them anywhere else. It's some sort of um, measuring mechanism maybe, I don't know, it's obviously a concrete filter, it's maybe stabilising the banking. I'm not honestly sure, but it's obviously an interesting thing, I don't see, I've not really seen them anywhere else. It could be an excuse for thinking as we're standing here, you could actually think that we're just stood on some country path, it doesn't really look very railway like at all, but uh, I assure you, this was once the middle and main line. There was two tracks here on this side and another two just there. It's a bit more obvious there with the ballast that you can still see. There's still a reminder actually in these bushes though. You've got one lone concrete sleeper still with its clips on. And there's actually an old clip as well around here, which uh, again is interesting to see. More modern style. But this is the first time we've actually seen ballast on this sort of west side of the line. We've been looking on the other side a lot and we've not seen much in the way of ballast. So again, it shows that obviously this is where the line once was in 1987. You can actually see this ballast is a lot dirtier and older than what we've seen on the other side. I saw what this piece of wood is over here. Now that is a wooden sleeper, obviously. It seems to have got a tree going through the middle of it. But that, probably, in fact, there's a load of sleepers at the bottom of the bank. You just glance from there, I think. Looks like there's a few more sleepers down there. There's a part of the older retaining wall as well at the bottom of there, but there's even a sleeper with a chair on that I've missed just then, look, let's try and scrub some of this off but the, uh, there's a, it's an embedded sleeper, it's completely under that tree actually, the tree has grown around it and there's even a few more as you look sort of through there we can work our way around to them, there's a lot of trees with thorns on and I'm fed up again, it's stuck on them to be quite honest with you but We'll proceed. But yeah, that's another one with its uh, chair still in place. Now you have to excuse the dog barking. I've, I've been waiting for it to shut up for a couple of minutes and it won't. But we're now uh, near the uh, bridge over Cars Lane. You can see the original retaining wall at the bottom. In fact, it's actually given way a bit down there. There's a bit of flood water in this little puddle. There's a, an original black ash bank in here as well, which would obviously be, I would say, the original banking. And a lot of the ballast is actually gone, leading to the fact that the newer line side the uh, section that was shot in 96 is now sort of way higher than us up there on that banking and um, it's actually a quite a steep sort of climb to get up onto it there's even i mean this is where the obviously there was two lines over here and there's even tree roots in the trap bed there's two tracks here and as i've mentioned before hard to believe a a scott or a jubilee coming storming up there or a peak or well, peaks don't do much storming but you know what I'm getting, getting at, like a, a 56 or a 47 coming flying up there. It's just hard to believe that it ever happened, but it did. I mean, these silver birch, they obviously pop up wherever coal and old railways and stuff like that have been. And 
They don't take much time to get up to that sort of height. Some of these would have been growing obviously in the 2000s. But the height of this climb up to here is pretty immense. I have no idea why the ballast shore for this bit is so high up to me, to be honest with you. Obviously it was re-ballasted before it finally was shut in 96. But uh, we'll make his way now onto Cars Lane Bridge. Cars Lane leads up to Alton Town as Cuddhoff itself, which is uh, in the distance behind us. You probably still have the cars actually up there in Cuddhoff on the microphone. In fact, you can see the edge of the town just on the hill over there. This is now Car Lane. Small Bridge Dyke does again go under this one as well, so it's a, it's a dual purpose bridge. It carries a little farm road and the river underneath it. And again, there's one of these, whatever they are, um, stabiliser things in the game. Again, it's a four track bridge. Have a look over the other side. There's nothing particularly interesting about it again. It's more farm access for over there, really. It doesn't go anywhere, it's a private road. And it's not actually a footpath, so I'm not supposed to go down there. So, for the purpose of this video, probably won't but interesting the signage on the wall there you may just about to be able to see it it tells you about the rail authority it's one of the old rail tracks i think cars lane cuddoff barnsley which tjc 3181 so now standing in what is pretty much a, a very peaceful sort of spot just like it's a place called cuddoff common that we're on here and we're looking at, across at what was a triangle of lines across this entire valley. This is the Dern Valley, the river being sort of there where I'm pointing in this gap. You can see where the land sort of di dives down. Now there was lines encircling all this area. Obviously behind us we've got the middle and main line that was here. The Chapel Town Loop ran along that banking on the far side and into those trees and then beyond to Ardsley Tunnel, indeed over the top of Stairfoot, and sort of roughly where I'm pointing over the hills was Monksbury Junction, about three miles away. On the other side of the valley, there was another line. The Great Central Railway's Horse of Main Collier Branch, which was located there and ran along. We're now walking onto what I believe would have been the down slow line of the Midland, where we found a couple of old signal posts. So on side, the sewage works just south of Cuddeth and uh, on the edge of Cuddeth Common. Now, just here we've noticed where Matt's roughly stood. There's actually the sign of a ladder where there would have been a signal. I, I feel like this one would have probably been next to the up slow. I think this, this was the arrangement or the up fast, sorry, on this side would have been around here. And then there would have been Another down line because the lines were staggered, you had down, up, down, up. So towards London being the up and towards the north being the down. And you would have had signal there and again a ladder. And that would have been a signal pointing towards the south and towards South Stars Mill Junction. And again you got also something else in the bushes, not sure what it is, but some sort of steel work, whether it was a sign or something else. We're about another 200 metres on from where we did the last little bit of video in, and we're actually coming across to look at what's left of some signalling cable that's been obviously pulled out, probably from the cable troughing. It's just been left, it's, it's stripped of all its copper and uh, sort of just roped everywhere over the trees. You see, completely empty casing, and it's just launched over the wall. There's quite a, quite a lot of it, to be honest. 
and this would have been here again since the 80s there's not been any signaling on here since the cut the track in 1987 that's when the last signaling would have been seen on here whether the engineers threw it over the wall or whether it's been thrown since i would suspect probably thrown since so we're walking along on the section that would have been on the right hand side so the section that would have been ripped up after 1985 when the through services stopped the passenger services and then beyond to 1987 when they eventually cut it the lines would in, that left until 1996 the line that was left until 1996 would have been up there on that ballast banking that you can see to our left you can certainly see the tree growth how it must have kicked in just beyond 1987 these have been growing you know well into the uh, early 2000s again there's a another pile there of signal cable so the a lot of the signal cabling there's lots of it that's for looking at that it goes way behind those trees but there's certainly a lot of signal cabling around which makes me think most of it's still here just strewn around we're now, as you can see, quite deep into the bowl of the valley. We've got quite a steep side over there. Stars Mill Lane is just sort of up there, over the top of this hill. We've just come down, noticing this interesting little point here. I suspect there may well have been a plate layers hut or something here. You can't get in there. I don't think you can get in there anyway. Um, there is a sleeper, complete with chairs still left here. I don't think there's any dates or anything on it. It's a concrete sleeper, so it would surprise me if there was. Um, but you can certainly see where this was once uh, a plate layers little hut or something, it would seem. And there's also a little area in there. Would have been right on the edge of the banking uh, when it was here. We're just moving on down further towards the south end of this valley and eventually towards where this video will end down at Stars Mill Junction, the site of. And uh, on the other side of the formation, we're now starting to come across to where we actually join up to the River Dern. Now this isn't the Dern Valley line, the Dern Valley line is on the other side of the valley where the uh, river runs across to. It's very close to us at this moment, it's probably about a mile to the formation. It's actually heaven. You know, just see heaven flying away through the bushes over there. It came out of the river, probably, I've disturbed it probably. You see the River Dern, very curving course, it comes under Ardley Viaduct which is just over there, over that hill. And then you can still see the banking of the uh, Great Central Hort and Main Collier branch coming down over there. And what Matt's found here looks like an old mile post, which I was basically stood next to and hadn't seen, but um, yeah, there's an old mile post head there by the looks of it. White paint on it, white and black paint. Yeah, still got various colors of paint. It's got yellow there from the, uh, from the original and then there's white as well. Oh, the white, there's less white, so. In fact, the white looks like it's under the yellow, so the white would have probably been the original Midland Railway paint. But it's incredible the steepness of this bank and how much ballast is down it. We've now made our way down actually to the bottom of the banking, and uh, see how it says actually on the surveys map that this area is prone to flooding. You can see evidence of that there. There used to be a headshunt of some sidings, some, uh, some exchange sidings, which we're going to look at shortly, it was where those bushes are. But at the bottom of this banking, not only have we found some signal rail and the original retaining wall and some original fence posts, the newer fence being right up there, but we found, or Matt found, what, whatever this appears to be, it looks like it was maybe a gate or something. There's evidence of some steps in here. Uh, there's some cable traffic that's fallen down. Whether there's some, some form of access was here, there's no sign of anything on the Ordnance surveys. But certainly an interesting little gate post whether there was a gate here to the right i'm not sure but you can see where something was hung off that obviously so something unusual that we've not seen yet so as i was saying it does get a lot more overgrown down here and sort of evidence of that we're still on we are still on ballast it's not on it's the ballast still here it's just under a lot of leaves there's a lot more in the way of brambles and stuff around and we're actually down quite close now to stars mill junction you can see from the other side of the valley just how close in we are actually joined this side of the valley the river being just sort of behind us over there and what we've joined down to is the site of some exchange sidings now these were stars mill exchange sidings i believe they were called and these were the midland railway sidings which connected to a branch at stars mill junction about 200 yards in that direction and the branch line used to go up to grimethorpe where the midland railway had some sidings up near the collier i believe uh, along with the great central also had a giant line joining with the midland to take them up there now this is the site of those sidings, they're very 
edge of them so you could see roughly where that tree is is where the track would have come out to and we're just sort of at the point where it starts to span out get wider as you can see where Matt sort of stood is where the boundary would have been and it gets wider and there's a, a couple of sidings in there there wasn't many there's two or three there are some concrete sleepers which have come off the main line itself just uh, thrown across and there's actually if you we're not going to work our way up the whole way up there because it'll take forever but there are lots of sleepers as you work your way up there probably go 50 or so what we did find is this perfectly preserved brick amongst the uh, rubble which is a stair foot brickworks Barnsley brick as you can see and that was actually face down when we found it so we'll just put it back like it was there's a massive slug under there but it was found face down so we'll preserve it with its name underneath and leave it where it was but there's also this pile of assorted stuff i'm not sure if that was ever railway related or not but uh, yeah just looking down these signs a little bit you can sort of see as i say how it used to extend out towards this side of the wall on this side there's a signal box opposite and we'll go and look where roughly where that was afterwards there's uh, again more signs of concrete sleepers these continue to crop up there's all sorts of signal cabling just stirred off to the ground now these sidings would have shut sometime in the 1960s maybe earlier they certainly weren't around when the line shut in the end in the 80s they would have been gone a long time before that now i thought there was some wooden sleepers in here but it seems i was wrong they're only concrete there's also a trainer and a basically a tire dump in the middle of it where you can see over there where people unfortunately do a lot of fly tipping there's loads of rubbish down near the actual junction site it's uh, down, in there, down a back lane out of Cudworth and unfortunately people take you this opportunity to uh, do a lot of fly tipping around here to the point where the area actually smells of rubbish as you get further in that direction so yeah this is the site of the sign you can see how wide it is now I'll take you over to the actual side of the embankment before I cut this little clip that amazes by the way so you've got a tire around the bottom of a tree look how tall the tree is and how wide the tree is as well and how many branches are on it there's no way you got that there any time in the last uh, 20 years so I suspect that was probably put over when the tree was like this one very narrow and the tree's actually grown around the tire so that's a unusual piece of rubbish a lot of like fox dens and stuff another little sign of something there indeed just here i don't want to disturb anything like that I walk across this out you know it could be weakened but there's also some rabbit hole holes and stuff in the bank here as well but this is the edge of the bank in the wall the retaining wall at the bottom so i'll work his way back across the track bed and over towards where the box so used to be. We're now standing on the site of what was Stars Mill Junction signal box. It was located just over my shoulder behind me. And it was here on the early hours of the morning of the 19th of January 1905 that a, a tragic accident took place. Now, since I moved to this area in March last year, I have noticed this valley is very prone to fog. And the 2.05 a.m. leads to Sheffield Mail Train had just made its book stop. I could have just around two miles up the line. It had made its way through here to Stars Mill Junction, but close behind it was the 305 lease to St Pancras Express, as it would have been every morning. It was close behind, and upon passing a red signal, it could have it tragically hit the back of the mail train at high speed. This resulted in the deaths of six people on the express train and 13 injuries. Sadly, a seventh person then died a couple of days later following injuries received in the accident. And it's quite sombering as you stand here amongst these trees, knowing that that happened, it's quite uncomfortable to stand here. And I just wanted to take a moment to pay tribute to what happened that night, that night in the early hours of that day back in January 1905.
So we're out the bottom end of West Arsmore Junction would have been the Midland line up there on that little hill above us. The line from Stormsmore Sidings where we were before coming down this line of trees. Before then turning left under this bricked up bridge and it would have gone under Stormsmore Lane here and then onwards to Grindthorpe Colliery, the Midland Railway, joining the Great Central which came across on that hillside over there. And they joined together to make a brief giant line before actually going into Grindthorpe Colliery, about a mile or two in that direction. A very short line and we may well follow it one day but there's not really much to see of it. This is the most significant part you will find with the old steel bridge above us. So we're coming to the end of part one now, we're just down at Stars Mill as I say. On the left here you've got the bridge where the uh, River Dern goes underneath and we'll have a look at that in a second with the mixed up bridge down at the end. We're moving down the bank in here to have a look at the, uh, the river bridge as it goes underneath. Try not to fall down as I do this. I'm running. So it's the typical sort of blue brick tunnel almost that you can see down here. It's quite interesting, sort of significant structure. The River Dern is quite a big river, of course. As we come down underneath the river bridge. So it is the Midlands typical sort of blue brick that you can see. And then underneath. Quite a sort of wide tunnel carrying the river through. Again, the, the River Dern does flow pretty quickly. And it sort of it goes into a little bit of a pool at the end here. And you can see that banking at the top is the banking that I was talking about before where the Grindfort branch used to go across from Stars Mill Junction just up there and it used to go across to Grindfort in that direction no more than a couple of miles and what's interesting about this side of the bridge is it's stone whether the other side was extended at some point I don't know but it's interesting that this side is stone obviously it's the road as well on this side but it's an unusual one as to why one half is stone and one half is blue brick and I'm looking it's only the outside that's stone actually, the whole thing underneath is brick. And that also carries Stars Mill Lane over the top, as well as the railway. So we're now up at the top of what is Stars Mill Lane, you'll have to excuse the amount of road noise that there is here. Looking back towards Cuddeth in that direction, we're at the top of a bridge which has been filled in. This form of cutting would have been around 80 miles an hour when it was open. It's obviously, as I say, it's been filled in. You can still see the top of the, the bridge itself here. And this is going to bring us to the end of part one of this video. We do hope you've enjoyed watching it and will join us in part two. And we're going to continue further south towards Horton Main, Darfield, and eventually down as far as Wath Road Junction. Try not to get killed in the process of crossing Stars Mill Lane, which unfortunately does have a tendency to be quite a dangerous road because of the speed people drive on it. So this is now the end of part two. I just cut off an interruption there for my car. You can see the Afarma Gate Central's Heart and Main Collier branch. You can just see the parapet of the bridge there. We'll cover that in part two because there is a cutting and stuff to look at in further detail. Please do join us then in part two and I hope you've enjoyed part one. Please leave us a comment if I've got anything wrong. Please let us know. Always looking to learn from things. But uh, thanks as always for watching guys. Cheers very much. See you later. <laughs>